and welcome to the afternoon's breakout session on addressing disability and accessibility within a social welfare society. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to moderate today's discussion. My name is Andrea Berman. I'm the Chief Programs Officer, and I work in our New York office. I'm very happy to be here today because the New Yorkos Foundation has um, supported many projects that address the needs of people with disabilities and increase accessibility. I've worked on many of these projects throughout our four program areas of arts, education, social welfare, and health and medicine. And I've worked on many of the projects in the United States, and many of my colleagues have worked on projects in Europe, as well as specifically in Greece. I'm just gonna highlight some of the grants that we've made in this sector to give you a sense of the, the range of the projects. In the arts, you'll soon be hearing from Francesca Rosenberg from the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, where the foundation has been the lead supporter of access programs since 2006. We have also supported the Cultural Heritage Without Borders for their work in the Western Balkans to increase access to museums for people living with disabilities there. And we have an innovative project at the Manchester Museum in the UK where they've developed haptic interactive technology to allow visitors to virtually touch precious art and artifacts with their own hands. In the education field, we have supported a very unique and innovative school in New York City called the Ideal School, which is fully inclusive, welcoming students who have dis disabilities such as Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, or attention dis deficit disorder alongside their peers, regardless of ability, gender, ethnicity, family structure, race, religion, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status. This is a model for which they have received international attention for possible replication. The issue of workforce development and employment for people with disabilities is important since unemployment rates among people with disabilities continues to rise. The foundation recently supported First Step Trust in the UK within its social welfare program area for an innovative social enterprise model that offers employment and training. It is worth noting that this project was recognized at this year's Zero Project Conference, which Michael Fenbeck will soon be telling us more about. The foundation has also supported another project that came out of a collaboration at the Zero Project Conference with the work of Handicap International and Light for the World. This project supports community-based rehabilitation projects in Ethiopia and South Sudan. In Greece, the foundation recently supported a collaborative initiative that addresses services for people who are visually impaired throughout the country. This is a unique grant that provided support to the Center for Education and Rehabilitation for the Blind, the Panhellenic Association of the Blind, and the Lighthouse for the Blind of Greece. I know some, some of them are in the audience. And in Greece, we've also been supporting Cerebral Palsy Greece, a leader in the field since 1997, basically since the foundation came into existence, and you will soon be hearing from Daphne Economou soon. I'd like to just briefly mention that um, according to the World Bank and the World Health Organization, approximately 15% of the world's population, or over 1 billion people, live with a disability, making that the world's largest minority group. This figure will only continue to arise with the population growth. So it's important that we have conversations like this to build our networks and make plans for the future. In the US, um, only 3% of philanthropic dollars are specifically designated to address the needs of people with disabilities. So it's very important that we can continue to make this topic uh, an important priority for the future. To, to just highlight how the session will run, I will introduce each one of our speakers who will briefly give an overview of the work that they do in their countries, in their unique perspective, and then we'll have an opportunity to hopefully make this as interactive as possible, opening the floor up for questions and um, interactive discussion. Hopefully audience members that work in the sector can also share some of their experiences. Before we start, I thought it would be interesting if we could just have people raise hands. Who from the audience is, is from Greece? So we get a sense. <laughs> Okay, great, a lot of people from Greece. And, and who in the audience uh, works in the disability sector? Great, so hopefully we'll have a lot, a lot of uh, good personal experiences to share. 
So now we'll start. I'll just briefly introduce Dr. Michael Fembeck, who is visiting us from Austria. He is the project director of the Zero Project at the Essel Foundation and the program manager for Social Affairs Department of Baumax. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Could you give me some power on this microphone? Or should, should I do this myself? Well, thank you. No, much better. Well, thanks for the introduction. Um, I got the privilege to stand in front of you. Um, as far as I know, I will be the only one, which is not because I'm more important than the other one, because there's the monitor in front of me, and I would not see you, and you would not see me, so I'm standing. Um, what I'm going to do is to start um, my presentation with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities because this is a framework that um, all of us and all of our work is somehow affecting. Um, uh, please, those uh, who work in the field, uh, excuse that I'm probably going into too much details, but uh, I think to have um, a common play field and a common field of discussion, we should um, have uh, the UN Convention which um, has become um, something like the Ten Commandments of the World for Dis of Disability um, a a as a start. After that, I will move on uh, to explain um, where our engagement, our initiative comes from, and then explain the Zero Project and um, uh, its, its um, potential for the future. So let's start with the, with the UN Convention. The UN Convention is um, in place since uh, 2008, and it's um, it's um, uh, let's call it a fantastic tool. It's it um, nobody, um, as far as I understood this in 2008, expected that it's going to happen at all, and uh, what could and uh, will become out out of it. Um, there are many conventions of the UN around, uh, starting with the, the Human Rights Declarations in, in 1948. Um, and, uh, but probably the, the UN Convention for Persons with Disabilities is, uh, is one of the most powerful. Uh, there's a reason for that. Um, people have learned um, about um, conventions and what they can do and what they can't do and what are their shortcomings. And uh, so what they put into it, which makes it, for example, quite powerful, is they have a, the, the convention has a, um, a monitoring system included, meaning um, that people who ratify the convention, so they put this into their legal system, into, um, into, into basic law, um, they also uh, ratify and they agree that their implementation of this UN convention is monitored and uh, that the um, the, the state and the government and the responsible um, uh, parties have to go to Geneva and present how uh, the uh, implementation of the UN Convention is improving. Uh, this monitoring system also includes civil society, which is also new that this is part of the, of the system, uh, that they are taking part and they are also um, monitoring and they are part of the system of, of monitoring. It's not only government itself who um, uh, rules itself and who explains um, if the convention is working or not, but it's also civil society. What is this UN convention about? Um, it's about accessibility, it's about inclusion, it's about independent living, about education, about employment um, and some other features, but these are probably the most um, dominant features of the of the UN convention and what's also great about it, um, there are some features in it uh, that have been discussed for decades about whether or not whether or not inclusive education is better, or should um, children with disability be uh, educated somewhere in, in, in their own schools or not, the UN Convention gives a clear answer that inclusion is the way to go and the, the, where uh, uh, education should happen. So an inclusive school is the, is, is the goal. Also, data collecting um, is, is one of the features that's really clear in the convention. Um, there were also some people said, uh, well, we don't want data collected about persons with disabilities. We know what happened in the past with uh, if someone looks at who has disabilities or not. Uh, we don't want that. It's quite clear that um, 
for the for the sake of persons with disabilities, data data has to be collected in order to to manage that, in order to, to give government information what works and what not what does not work, how many people are affected, how many people are living in in which uh, environment, how many people are living in homes. Uh, so if you don't have that information, you cannot manage that. So um, the, the UN Convention is a powerful tool. 128 countries, and still counting, have uh, ratified the UN Convention, including the European Union, which makes it the first time. Uh, Luke, you know that much better than me. But I think it's the first time ever that an, an supranational body like the European Union has signed a convention, uh, not only this one, but ever. No? So uh, this is also quite interesting that the European Union has, has done that, which also, for example, if you think about issues like public procurement, uh, where, where uh, the European Union wants to do a lot more, if the public, if the government uh, is um, obliged to give contracts only to organizations and, and companies um, that, um, uh, that do something for persons with disabilities or whatever, then this is, a, or even a, a have to respect that uh, in, in a minimum way, uh, this could be quite powerful in the future. So um, this is um, a, a brief intro to, uh, to the UN Convention. Where do we come from? Where do I come from? Um, as um, Andrea told you already, I'm working for an Austrian foundation, the Essel Foundation. Essel being the name of the family who founded uh, the foundation and who owns the Baumax Company Group. Ba Baumax is a company, um, I'll give you some rough figures, I didn't give you so far. Now I'm giving you some rough figures. Um, uh, it's a company group, it's a retail company working in, in uh, do-it-yourself and, and um, home, uh, improving home, um, furbishing, refurbishing um, stuff, uh, gardening uh, stuff. Uh, we work in nine countries, we have some 10,000 employees and a turnover of 1.5 million euro, which in the European context is mid-size. In an Austrian context, it's quite a big company. Uh, the Austrian, the family Essel is quite well known in Austria. Um, also for being a quite um, responsible and socially active um, uh, family. They also have their own museum uh, with, uh, with the biggest art collection of contemporary art in, in, in Middle Europe. So um, they're doing a lot and what they especially do, and I'm happy to work with that company since 2009, is um, there's employment of persons with disability right at the heart of the company. Um, among these 10,000 employees, Depending on how you count them, there are some 200 to 400 persons with disabilities in every market, in every store, there's at least one. The foundation has been started by um, the, the family in 2007, and its mission is quite uh, naturally derived from being an entrepreneurial family to, um, to uh, work in social entrepreneurship and social innovation and disability. And one of the Two key projects that we are that we have developed um, is the Zero project uh, with the subtitle and mission for a world without barriers. So Zero is for zero barriers, um, and um, we have developed um, um, a concept that we find really encouraging, and um, I think we're also encouraging a lot of people, including Luke and his uh, his uh, his group, um, and also Niakos has already taken part in the. Um, in, in the process, in the, in the conference, and have also nominated projects. What we do is, in, in, a, in a very brief explanation, we have put together a network of experts worldwide uh, that work in different fields on disability issues. There, there are academics, there are activists, there are persons with disabilities themselves, there are administration people, there are parliamentarians and politicians, international bodies, NGOs, foundations, all of them normally work on in their very way on, on these issues, but they don't come together. So this is one of the key features that we bring these people together. So we create platforms. But before we do that, uh, we um, encourage this network of people to nominate innovative practices and to nominate innovative policies. What they think that in their field, in their country, in their region is something that works, not what does not work. Everybody knows that most of things are not working, are not working sufficiently, but to point out what they think is extraordinary, to, think, to, to point out what is an innovation that supports persons with disabilities. We have developed a process in the last three years uh, where uh, experts nominate, uh, they evaluate, and uh, finally they also select uh, the most outstanding innovations uh, in practices and policies. We make a difference, I don't go into details, 
but we divide, make, make a, a division between practices. Practices meaning something that has been developed by uh, social entrepreneurs, by NGOs, or even by companies, and policies, which is more an innovation on the regulation side, where laws have been changed, laws have been implemented, rules, standards have been implemented that define new rights for persons with disabilities that finally definitely help them uh, in, their, in, in their living. So this is the first part is the process of, um, of finding these innovative practices and policies. And the second part, as already mentioned, uh, we create platforms for that. We have a report, we have a website, and we have a conference um, to, uh, to, um, to share the news, to highlight uh, the most interesting innovative practices and policies. And the conference is probably the key part of it, uh, where uh, every year in Vienna, some 250 experts uh, meet and, and um, get to know about these policies and practices, get to know each other, and hopefully a lot of fruitful discussions and cooperations start. I want to end, I got 20 seconds, but I will m make it one minute and 20 seconds. Um, we think that this networking approach is a, is a, is a, is a good one. We heard that already uh, that collaboration um, is, is the thing. Uh, nobody, not even the most wealthy person, can do it alone. Um, so I think the question is more how to structure a cooperation. A cooperation is easy to talk about, but how to implement this. If you put 10 experts on disability in one room and say, we are going to discuss a problem, you probably have 11 solutions, or probably even 12 because they will not agree on one, so it, it's not so easy to cooperate. If it's easy, it would be done already. And we keep on working on, on, um, on developing this, uh, this process, how, how, to, how to get uh, their experts in, in cooperation, in collaboration, in doing something. And um, so this is our approach to, to, um, to improve the, this networking model and this networking approach. Um, so it's about the organizational stuff and it's also about um, how to how to dis distribute the knowledge this is the point of course where um, we um, have to do uh, the most work what we are organizing in Vienna what we do with the website in English what we do with the report which has only um, a few thousand copies is only something like um, like the peak of it all we want to, to work in the future how to also regionalize the project, how to bring the knowledge and the most innovative practices and policies into one country and help the people in that very country. So this is our way forward and everyone who feels encouraged to contribute, uh, I would be more than happy to get some uh, requests. We are open for any expert who wants to contribute and we find a role for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. I'm now going to introduce Luc Zelderloo, who is with us from Belgium. He has been active in the disability sector for more than 30 years, and he is one of the founders of the European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities, known as EASPD. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, now that Michael said that he would be the only one standing, I don't dare to stand, so I will uh, stay uh, seated and do my presentation uh, from here. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Foundation and the Foundation Center uh, for, for inviting me. Both are, I think, uh, very important actors promoting positive uh, change in, in, in Europe and uh, beyond. As said by the, our chair, I'm indeed Secretary General of ESPD, and ESPD is a European-wide uh, uh, network of services. Uh, we represent uh, today around uh, 10,000 organizations active across the continent, across Europe, uh, and across disability. Uh, and uh, all these services uh, try to, um, to work on uh, the correct implementation of the uh, UN Convention, the UN Convention which was introduced by uh, Michael uh, a minute ago. And um, to, to put that, uh, to put a, somewhat more flesh on the bones of that, um, 
our challenge, I think, as service providers is to, uh, to provide uh, quality services, um, and that means that the service must be available and accessible, and I think that that is the focus of this uh, session here this afternoon, and I will try in, um, in 15 minutes to, to, to bring in some elements uh, uh, for, for, uh, for a good debate. My friends say that my English is somewhat Arafatish. I would like to apologize uh, for that. But uh, when showing hands, uh, I noticed that most of the, the people in the audience uh, might not have English as mother tongue, so you might not even notice. That's, that's very good. That's very good. Uh, but sorry for the native speakers. My English is a bit uh, Arafatish. OK. Um, let's let's start. Uh, I briefly introduced my organisation uh, already, um, and I would like just like to add one little uh, element to what was said by, by Michael with regard to the convention. Quite often, uh, uh, people ask me to which extent is the convention uh, relevant for support providers for services, uh, and then uh, my answer uh, is is double. One. For me, the convention is not about persons with a disability. It's a bit provocative, maybe. The convention is about the type of society we want. The convention is about the type of society we want and how we want to support persons with a disability in that, in that society, as full citizens uh, in that society. And that means that instead of, instead of uh, bringing the people to the support, that's what we did in the past. Special schools, special employment, special, special, special. The challenge for the, in the future is how can we bring the support to the people? How can we mainstream the support? And how can we make sure that the support is of a good uh, quality? Uh, let's start with my presentation. Brief chapter, uh, three brief chapters that look at availability and accessibility in times of uh, crisis. Uh, and accessibility and availability are interlinked. Uh, and throughout my presentation, I will hint now and then uh, on what uh, philanthropic uh, organizations could do to promote, indeed, positive uh, change. First of all, let's look at, at uh, what, what the challenges are in the sector. Uh, of course, the crisis has, an, has a huge impact on the sector, and I will come back to that. But even without a crisis, even without economic difficulties and austerity, we uh, would have to change our approach, uh, I think. And I just listed a few um, uh, of the, the, the drivers of change uh, on this slide. First of all, there is the demographic change. Uh, Europe, and not only Europe, uh, also the States, uh, we are aging, whether we want to or not. And I give you just one figure. I'm from Flanders, Belgium. If we keep on supporting seniors in the same way as we did in the past, and we will do that in the future, then we have to open in a small little entity uh, as Flanders, then we have to open a center for elderly, a home, every week for the coming 40 years. Every week, a new residential center for the coming 40 years. You, we all understand that that is not how we should approach things. We have to think outside the box and come up with, with new solutions, I think. First driver of change, demographic change. Aging, family patterns change, people are more mobile. Second driver of change, of course, the crisis, and I uh, come back to that. But third driver of change, a change in paradigm, a change in how we see uh, persons with a disability and their family. And it was, it was touched already by the previous speaker. Persons with a disability are not longer seen as objects of care, but, and the UN Convention confirms that in a very clear way, but they are rights holders. And the challenge for us, for service providers and for other actors in society is to remove the barriers, is to remove the barriers so that they can live a life like everybody else. Fourth driver of change, technology. Um, we should not underestimate the impact of technology also on our sector and on the care sector. I have seen uh, wonderful models on how new technology can contribute to the development of very empowering services, services that allow people to live their own life in the way they want to live it. 
So there are many different uh, um, factors that push this change. It is not only the crisis, but I promised you to look at the crisis. So let's look at the crisis. The impact of the crisis on services is, and we monitor the crisis since, uh, since the very beginning, since 2008, 2009, and we are not alone, also the European Foundation Center um, uh, did some very important work uh, in, in that respect. And you can see figures at, uh, at the, in, in the yellow bar uh, on the slides. Um, what do we see? We see that uh, the sustainability, the availability, and the quality of the services are seriously hit by the impact of the crisis and the austerity uh, measures. Decrease in budgets, longer waiting lists, and also uh, lower uh, quality of services. And maybe the most worrying thing is that we notice across the continent, across Europe, we see that um, innovation came to a standstill. In 2008, 2009, also triggered, pushed by the convention, we saw that processes of change start to take off. Local, national, municipal authorities um, took up the challenge and started to, to, to promote innovation. This innovation came to a standstill, and that is really very, very worrying. We see, uh, we see tendencies of reinstitutionalization. Children with a disability, uh, adults with a disability, are again referred back to large segregating settings and cannot live their life anymore in, uh, in, uh, in society. And that is very worrying, I think. And maybe here I can give a first hint um, when it comes to, to the role of philanthropic organizations. Please support innovation and, and, and don't... don't uh, don't invest too much in um, renovating uh, old, uh, old, outdated uh, service uh, models. A huge impact on the services sector, but an even bigger, more important impact on the persons with a disability themselves, on the level of employment, education, and indeed also Article 19. Uh, it was uh, brought up already independent living. At the level of employment, it's clear persons with a disability last in, first out. That is the reality. We saw an improvement in the statistics right before the crisis. We can start all, all over again. We see that many, many uh, enterprises um, uh, fired persons with a disability. When it comes to education, we see that there uh, is less inclusive mainstream education now than four years ago. So very worrying. And we also see that in independent living schemes, uh, many countries uh, cut it a lot. Although they know we have the proof, we have the data, although they know that independent living and support schemes that support people in the community are less expensive than large residential institutionalized care. If you want to have more details on that, we can discuss it after uh, this uh, session. Uh, here. Am I not speaking too fast for the Greek colleagues that follow on, that follow the interpreters? Interpreters, is not too fast? Still more or less okay? Thank you. Thank you. Native speakers, it's not too Arafatish? <laughs> no? Okay, good. <laughs> and less visible, a less visible impact of uh, an effect of the crisis is that the cost for services, the own contribution of the person with a disability or the family to the service uh, went up, which means, in fact, that there is more, uh, more pressure on the family and on the informal carers. And that has, I think, an, a, a very important uh, effect on the family life and on how uh, labor markets are organized. In the 50s, 50s and the 60s, um, women were pushed into the labor market because they were needed for the economic growth. Now they are pushed out and uh, they, uh, they have to pick up the caring tasks in the families again. Um, we, should, we should think twice about these type of uh, developments. Um, I don't think that we should uh, support these type of developments. But for me, the most important and the most worrying development is and I will, will uh, not go through the slide, but tell you the little story. 
A few weeks ago, I was uh, in, I will not name the country, I was at a meeting with service providers, and a group of these service providers, um, some of them are wheelchair users, uh, people that organize their own service and that do that in cooperation with others. And one of these young men, well, young men, for me, men are pretty fast young because I'm rather old. Um, one of these, one of these uh, uh, young men said to me, some years ago, people looked at me with a sort of pity in their eyes. Oh, you poor disabled guy. Now, and that's due to the crisis, he said, now people look at me as, you take part of my tax money. You take part of my social security investment. And that is very worrying. And I think, again, uh, philanthropic organizations should, I think, be aware of that and work on awareness raising to avoid this very negative change in, in how people think about uh, vulnerable people uh, in society and persons with a disability. In fact, society starts to blame people again for being disabled. And that is, I think, uh, the opposite of what uh, we envisage with a correct implementation of the, uh, of the UN uh, Convention. So what's the impact of the crisis? It has a huge impact of services, on services. It has an even more uh, uh, risky impact on the position of persons uh, with a disability, but it is not only the crisis that, uh, that is triggering uh, change and the need for innovation, I think. Let's look at a few other uh, important challenges for our sector. I hinted already in, in, in that direction. In the sector, the services sector, uh, we, we are facing three very important challenges. Deinstitutionalization of the services we have developed in the employment field, in the education field, and in the day-to-day uh, -day, um, uh, living support, residential uh, support services. And this deinstitutionalization, making the move towards community uh, care, is absolutely needed if we want to um, uh, facilitate full citizenship for persons uh, with a disability. And I listed a few characteristics of institutionalized care and uh, community uh, care. There is no time during this brief presentation to go into uh, the details. And here um, are the mistakes we all make, the mistakes uh, member states make, local authorities make, and I must say sometimes also service providers and philanthropic organizations make. We sometimes overinvest in the old system and think that with more money it will become better. Or we set up parallel systems, or we organize alternatives without changing the culture, the institutionalized uh, culture, or uh, we close institutions without having alternatives in the community. We should not dump people in the streets without uh, appropriate support. So we should try to avoid this, and I hope that the philanthropic organizations can help us uh, fighting uh, these, um, uh, replicating these uh, mistakes. The institutionalization, a very important challenge. Second challenge, the growing inequalities uh, in access to services. We see three levels. First of all, I said it already, people have to pay more for their support service than a few years ago. That's the first layer. The second layer is that we see across Europe inequalities between different vulnerable groups. Some vulnerable groups have easier access to support systems than uh, others. And the third layer is that we see within the group of persons with a disability, those that have very significant needs uh, are not visible. Uh, we see it in the policies developed by, by the European Union, for instance. There is a strong focus on employability and on bringing people to the market and the labor market. What about those who need 24-7 support and that are very, very uh, severely uh, disabled? And uh, I should try to wrap up. Does that mean in one minute or in two minutes? <laughs> okay, I'll try to do it in, 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 in one to two minutes then. Um, this is, I think, a very uh, important additional challenge. What we should not forget, 
is that uh, we, uh, we only also face new vulnerable groups. One of them are the family carers and the people working in the social sector. We see an overrepresentation of the staff, the first line staff working in the social sector amongst the working poor. We should be aware of that. If you want quality services, well, as the Americans say, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. Well, we should, inv if we want quality <laughs> services, we should, we should invest in, in, in the sector. And we should not forget that families go through difficult times uh, today. Wrapping up, as asked by our chair, um, we looked at uh, how the sector uh, should look in the future, and we came to, uh, to 10 quality requirements. Uh, for social services uh, in the future. And I will not go through the list, but the bottom line is the services should be set up in cooperation with mainstream actors, with the people themselves and their families, of course, and it should uh, facilitate uh, full citizenship and um, make it, uh, make it uh, easier for them to enjoy a life like uh, everybody else. Um, last slide. If you fail to plan all this, well, then you plan to fail. Uh, the key challenges for the years to come are clear. We have to bring the support to the people. We also have to bring our know-how as specialized sector to the mainstream so that they can make the mainstream more accessible and more available to persons with a disability. And we have to make sure that we further develop knowledge and uh, expertise. Um, I hope that this uh, brief presentation contributes uh, to the debate, and I hope the debate will contribute to a more inclusive uh, society where all citizens uh, feel valued and feel respected. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Luke. Uh, I'm now going to introduce Daphne Ekanomu, who is our local representative from Greece. She was born in India and educated in England, and she's the founding member of and the current chairman of Cerebral Palsy Greece. Shall we wait for the telephone? <laughs> Thank you. Um, in this gathering, Shall we really wait for the telephone? Okay. In this gathering of very important people, you will allow me to begin my presentation with a very simple quotation from Alice in Wonderland. Alice opened the door and found that it led into a small passage. She knelt down and looked along the passage into the loveliest garden you ever saw. How she longed to get out of the dark hall and wander about in those beds of bright flowers and those cool fountains. But she could not even get her head through the doorway. And even if my head will go through, thought Alice, it would be very little use without my shoulders and they would be sure to get stuck. What more can we say about the frustrations caused by inaccessibility? Lewis Carroll has said it all. Let us just consider the images presented here. The narrow passage, the dark hall, the tiny door, the big clumsy head, the even clumsier shoulders. And beyond, the loveliest garden you ever saw, the bright flowers, the cool fountains, just out of reach. Inaccessibility frustrates desires and dreams. And for people with disabilities, these should not be seen as unrealistic and unattainable, but as the justified need to live a normal and independent life as an integrated member of the human race. Everyone agrees that social inclusion for the person with disability is an unquestionable right Yet life is full of the frustrations that human beings inflict on one another through short-sightedness, ignorance, or indifference. But when we are also obliged to contend with inanimate obstacles and barriers in our everyday lives, 
It is no wonder that poor Alice is resigned to the fact that she must give up any attempt at reaching the lovely garden. The lovely garden is not for her because she is impeded by her physical inability to get her head through and shoulders through the door, because she does not fully conform to the norms of size and shape. You are not a girl at all, one of the animals declares later in the book. You are too big. So even her identity as a member of her own species is open to debate, and she is made to feel stupid and guilty as if it were all her own fault. Many with people with disabilities and their parents have felt this way and avoid circulating in public places. But this is a sad situation because what it comes to is that the existence of a considerable number of people who live amongst us is ignored by the wider public and as a result of this state of non-existence, their ultimate social inclusion is greatly dislayed, delayed. If people with disabilities do not circulate amongst us because there are no provisions for them to do so, there is nothing to remind the public of their existence. So what is truly to blame in this vicious circle of dissatisfaction? Is it the disabled person himself who insists on his right to enter the lovely garden? Is it the non-disabled person who is too pressed for time and unconcerned to give a hand? Or is it simply that the door is too small, the passage too narrow, and the hall too dark? Some years ago, these considerations provided a theme and a point of departure for a small group of young men and women from cerebral palsy Greece called at that time Spastic Society Athens. They formed a working team to examine the architectural barriers faced by the physically impaired in the city of Athens. A project that would be stimulating and meaningful for themselves, but also of some potential value to others. Cerebral palsy Greece has always encouraged research, as we believe very strongly that we can only hope for solutions if we possess accurate information as to the causes, conditions, and extent of a problem. The project aimed to benefit physically impaired people by involving them in a survey into their own needs, to enlighten the public as to the capabilities of people with disabilities, and to examine and record existing problems, and to propose feasible and practical solutions with the purpose of awakening public awareness and encouraging the authorities to take positive action. The purpose of the survey was to attest, evaluate, and confront the difficulties encountered not only by people with disabilities in the city of Athens, but by each and every citizen, young or old, at some period of his or her life. To examine every aspect of the city and particularly those areas which every citizen will invariably frequent. The team of 10 was comprised of six physically disabled people, one social worker, one parent, one architect, and one student. They were all volunteers. Two members of the team are here today, Caterina and Filaretti are here with us. Over a period of three years, they conceived, planned, organized, and conducted the survey, personally visited and tested all the sites, recorded and classified the data, and published the final results. They began their work by dividing their investigation into the following sections, pedestrian circulation and public transport, ministries and buildings of public administration, hospitals, universities and colleges, museums and cultural centers, theaters and cinemas. For all buildings, the aspects examined in details were the following, stairs, ramps, handrails, elevators. A, a grading system was implemented for all buildings, very good, good, medium, bad, very bad 
bad, very bad would be, be over 15 steps and no elevator. For the section on pedestrian circulation and public transport, an overall survey and report was made. The members of the team circulated in the streets of Athens and negotiated buses, trolleys and trams. They personally visited, tested and graded the accessibility of 21 stations, 19 ministries, 37 hospitals, 15 colleges and universities, 12 museums, 38 theatres and 31 cinemas. What they discovered was a city of obstacles, blockages, steps and barriers, where circulation and access was problematic even for those who are not confined to wheelchairs or otherwise impaired. The streets of Athens were a disaster for all pedestrians. Buses and trolleys were overcrowded, badly driven and precarious for anyone unsteady on their feet. Out of 21 underground stations, only two entrances were accessible and 16 were totally inaccessible. Out of 20 ministries, only seven had good accessibility. Eight hospitals were totally inaccessible with more than 15 steps and no elevators. There was not a single university with even good accessibility and seven were very bad indeed. Only two museums were fully accessible and in the whole of Athens, out of 69 theatres and cinemas, only 13 were accessible at all. For a further six months, the team worked on the final classification of all their data. Texts and reports were prepared and conclusions drawn up and proposals made. The survey results with tables, drawings, evaluations and proposals were printed and published in book form. The title chosen was Athens, an inaccessible city for the disabled. The booklet is here for anyone who is interested in, in its Greek form and with an English translation. The booklet was widely distributed and the impact was immediate and far reaching. For this was the first comprehensive survey conducted by physically disabled people themselves into the suitability and accessibility of pedestrian circulation, public transport, public services and facilities and educational and recreational buildings in the city of Athens. In 1990, the project was awarded a European award under the Ilios program for independent living. Exactly 10 years later, the team decided that the time had come to reevaluate the areas of concern and assess what progress had been made. A sample of 43 buildings that had been rated as poor to bad were selected for re-evaluation. The results were disappointing. 29 buildings had not changed at all and continued to be either totally inaccessible or extremely problematic for people with any form or degree of physical disability. What is the situation today and how much has changed? A few buildings have improved considerably and because of new legislation, some new buildings are excellent. The new buses are designed to accommodate people in wheelchairs and there are generally more facilities for disabled people. The metro stations are accessible, but pavements are still a disaster. And although level crossings for wheelchairs have been installed on certain street corners, they are invariably blocked by scooters and motorbikes. So what has been achieved? Our survey has certainly furthered the cause of disabled people in Greece by reminding the public of their existence and of their rightful participation in the life of the city. The authorities have been compelled to take notice as it is impossible to ignore the foolproof testimony of disabled people themselves. The survey proposes simple and inexpensive solutions after each chapter, solutions that could be immediately applied and would greatly improve the situation. Some of these proposals have been taken into account and there are certain improvements. However, it is attitudes that have not changed enough. 
if we are to talk of a social welfare society. It is not enough to install ramps and handrails and elevators and to fix pavements and level crossings for the blind and the physically impaired. When people slam doors in people's faces, when young boys and girls sit in buses while old and disabled people stand, when cars and scooters run down pedestrians and mothers with prams and park on pavements and level crossings, it is often human attitudes that are blocking the disabled person's inclusion in everyday life. The truth is, as usual, somewhere in the middle, and we should not generalize. In totally accessible cities abroad, we have encountered more disapproving glances than in Greece. It always surprises me that Dr. Schoebler fights his way up steep ramps in his wheelchair, and nobody lends a hand. Perhaps he refuses help but that is a question of attitude too. We are all living and learning all the time. And what is important is that we as members of a social welfare society should share the responsibility by offering our own decisive contribution so that together with Alice, hand in hand, as friends and co-citizens, we can overcome the obstacles and reach the beautiful garden. If I have half a minute, I would like to show you a, a literally half a minute TV spot called My Best Friend, just to stress what I mean by human attitudes that build bridges and break down barriers. Um, just for our English friends, the text says, My Best Friend Walks With Wheels, he helps me reach even higher. With my friend, everything is fun. I know that my friend will always be there when I need him. With my friend, we are always winners. My best friend invited me to my school called Open Door, and there I made many friends. O calteros mu filos, perpatai me erodes. Me voisai, naftaso akoma pio psila. Με τον καλύτερο μου φίλο είναι όλα αστεία. Ξέρω ότι ο καλύτερος μου φίλος θα είναι πάντα εκεί όταν τον χρειάζομαι. Με τον καλύτερο μου φίλο γίνουμε πάντα νικητές. Μια μέρα ο καλύτερος μου φίλος με κάλεσε στο σχολείο του που λέγεται Πόρτα Ανοιχτή. Εκεί έκανα πολλούς καινούριους φίλους. <Ρι> για να μείνει όμως πάντα η πόρτα ανοιχτή, θα στέλνουμε όλους για φίλους. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daphne. Lastly, I'm going to introduce Francesca Rosenberg, who is with us from New York City. She is the Director of Community Access and School Programs at the Museum of Modern Art, known as MoMA. And in her 18 years with the museum, she and her team have won national and international respect for MoMA's efforts to make the museum accessible to all. Thank you. So hard to end a, a panel that's this good, but I'll do my best to, um, to share from my perspective. Um, so of course we've been talking about how disability touches us all. It's part of the human condition. And as my slide says, the disability community is the only minority group that anyone can join at any time. Um, since I'm from the United States, I'll tell you the demographics there. There are approximately 54 million people in the U.S. who have disabilities, so about 20% of the population. That's one in five people, and certainly these numbers will continue to rise. It affects us, people we know, and by extension, the people we serve through our NGOs. 
people with disabilities are part of our general public at the Museum of Modern Art. How many of you show with hands have been to MoMA in New York? Oh, good. Okay. So, a little less than half. We have to get more people there. <laughs> um, MoMA, and here it is in this slide with some um, visitors entering the museum, the, f the facade of the museum is shown. Um, we're committed to serving all people with disabilities and we have a long history of this. We are legally obligated in the U.S. to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act, but we strive to go above and beyond embedding a philosophy of accessibility and inclusivity throughout all aspects of the museum's operations. By addressing not only physical, but programmatic and attitudinal barriers, we aim to achieve equality of participation for every visitor. This is an institutional priority. We offer programs and services for people across the lifespan. Programs are developed with an advisory board of people with disabilities to ensure their success. All programs are free of charge, thanks to generous funding, especially from the New Yorkos Foundation. And so I'll quickly just run through some of the programs to, just to give you an idea. Here is a slide of um, two young uh, children creating um, works of art with clay. So for the youngest audiences, we offer school programs. Um, these aim to fill part of the gap that schools are experiencing with cuts and decreased offerings in the arts. A growing body of evidence confirms the benefits of using arts in healthcare settings. And this, show, uh, this slide shows one of our educators going off site into a hospital and um, filling the time with patients who can look at reproductions of works of art from our collection. And in these programs, we are promoting communication, self-expression, and transforming the hospital experience, bringing joy to those who are there. We aim to provide an inclusive and supportive environment. Programs for people with learning and developmental disabilities include art looking and art making employing a variety of teaching strategies which ap appeal to different learning approaches and styles. All programs are age appropriate, and this is especially important to, it's especially important to offer separate programs for older individuals with disabilities, um, because especially with people with developmental disabilities, we've learned that there is a lack of offerings for adults. We partner with outside community organizations that have aligning goals. For instance, this slide shows um, someone from The Bridge in New York, which is an organization which provides mental health rehabilitation services. Our partnership with The Bridge culminates in an exhibition of work created during, uh, during the sessions together, and it's actually in our education building. So how many people can say that they've had their work on display at the Museum of Modern Art? It's pretty exciting for all. We have programs for visitors who are deaf or hard of hearing. We've had a touch tour for people with vision loss since 1972, and this slide shows a, a touch tour where a visitor is uh, touching a bronze work of a figure by Henri Matisse. We also have a program, an audio guide with visual description, which essentially paints a picture in the mind's eye for someone who can't see the work of art that's before them. MoMA was one of the first museums in the world to offer extensive programs for people with Alzheimer's disease and other dementia we were able to create free resources, a book, a website, and training videos. And we found that looking at art, which doesn't require memory, can be a transforming experience and enhance the quality of life for people with dementia and their caregivers. 
as was mentioned by Daphne, we too understand the power of evidence-based research. And so we carried out a study with New York University's Medical Center to measure quality of life outcomes in both participants with Alzheimer's disease and their caregivers. We found that both experienced elevated mood directly after participating in our program. Caregivers reported an increase in social support. Participants with Alzheimer's disease reported an increase in self-esteem and caregivers reported fewer emotional problems in the week following their visit to MoMA. The full report is available on our website. We regularly evaluate all of our programs, and for one assessment after an access program, we ask people to fill in the blank. I went to MoMA and, and here's what it said. It says, I felt love. We are proud of the human connectedness that participants feel and the personal relationships that are developed with staff and the museum as a whole through our programs. In this three minute video, you can hear directly what participants have to say about our programs. But the majority of people with disabilities visit the museum independently outside of an education program on their own or more likely with family or friends. As mentioned by Luke, inclusion and mainstreaming is the ideal. And I've been working with colleagues from across the museum to make MoMA accessible, as accessible as possible to the independent visitor. 
Not only is it the right thing to do, it's also good for business. We put an emphasis on training. This is something that's possible without much expense. All frontline staff, including security, visitor services, um, educators, staff in our retail stores, staff from our membership, need to feel empowered and disability competent and confident. This training includes replacing misconceptions with facts, teaching proper language and best communication strategies. We've also made enhancements to the physical space, and this is more expensive. <laughs> but again, thanks to, um, to generous support from foundations and corporations and individuals, we have loop equipment for sound amplification throughout the museum. We have augmented seating areas and new power assist doors which enable people with disabilities to navigate the building independently. But they are not just for people with disabilities. For instance, a mother with a stroller benefits from an automatic door and a ramp as opposed to stairs, as we see in this slide. And so you see, serving people with disabilities better serves everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Francesca. Um, I, I actually had a lot of questions, but given the fact that we only have about 15 minutes and we want to have as interactive discussion as possible, I'd like to open up the, the floor and um, encourage anyone to ask a question or, or bring, um, I know there's a lot of people working in the field, feel free to bring some of your work to all of our attention. Thank you. My name is Gabriel from Austria, Light for the World. Thank you for SNF uh, supporting us. Yeah. Uh, it, it was mentioned implicitly but not explicitly. There are, up to my mind, and I'm interested what you're saying about that, there are two paradoxa why the UN Convention and the legal uh, 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 implications are not working. And I guess, and I'm listening to you, the one is uh, that um, the greatest opponents of making uh, towards an inclusive society are social welfare organizations, charity organizations who say, we have these in institutions, we have the personnel, we have practiced since 30 years, and now we, show, uh, we should go to inclusion. What, what does it mean for our organization? One suggestion. Second is even parents who say, I do not know where that works because I cannot see where that works. It's paradox, uh, but it's, it's important not to blame the, the wrong people being in, 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 inactive. And the other thing is also paradox, inclusive education, what is uh, uh, Stavros Nyahos Foundation supporting with Light for the World. In Europe, in, the, in Austria, it's the same. Uh, myself have two disabled children. Uh, it's difficult to achieve it because it's no, not a standard. In developing countries, only three to five children out of 100 go to school. But with our programs we start, you start directly with inclusion. and You don't have to, to close uh, the special education institution before. There's an advantage to do these programs in, in developing countries. But what do you think about this paradox? Thank you. I'll try to be very brief to allow uh, more, more interaction and questions. Um, first of all, um, in, in, in reply to what was said by the two speakers that, that talked about uh, accessibility, we should not forget that if you plan accessibility in from the very beginning, it's nothing to do with your question, sorry, I'll come to your question in a second, then the additional cost is 0.17%. So, when you start to think about, oh, we need a new bus, or we need a new, uh, a new building, or a new hotel, and at that moment, 
you start thinking about accessibility as well, then the additional cost is 0.17%. So the cost is not relevant. Which is important to just highlight since we are building the Stavros New Yorkers Foundation <laughs> Cultural Center and is the plan exactly. to be fully accessible. Be exactly. Fully accessible. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. accessibility, it is crucial to think about it from the very beginning, whether we develop a website or a hotel or a holiday infrastructure, whatever. Same goes for uh, restructuring and renovation. Uh, with regard to your question, uh, the question is, is about resistance. And there is resistance uh, everywhere, but there, is also, there are also islands of excellence everywhere, I think, uh, in, in, in so-called poorer countries, but also in, 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 in richer countries. You can find islands of excellence. And the challenge is to make these islands of excellence the mainstream, the common, the common practice. And you're right that sometimes uh, the, the well-established systems um, generate resistance, but sometimes it's, it's also uh, groups of, of families or, or authorities. Sometimes people are afraid because they don't see what the alternative is or can be. And that is why it is so important to make, to make the new approaches visible and to have these islands of excellence. And that's why Zero Project is so, is so important and your project is so important. We need that to show that it is possible. And it is possible. We know that it is possible. We know that deinstitutionalization is less expensive than community services. But people think, what will happen with these children or these young adults with a disability in society without support. No, that's not, that's not the way we should look at it. So uh, there are many ways where the resistance is coming from, but it's possible to, to tackle this together. And for me, a key element is stakeholder cooperation. You have to have everybody at the table. Otherwise, those that are not at the table will organize the resistance. That means you need the trade unions at the table. Those that rep represent the people working in these services, you need to have them at the table. You have to have, when you talk about children with disability, you have to have the families, the parents at the table. When you talk about uh, reforming structures and rerouting funding streams, you have, of course, you have to have uh, the service providers at the table, otherwise they feel, they feel threatened. Stakeholder cooperation is important, but stakeholder cooperation based on clear values and principles. And that is why it is so correct what Michael said at the very beginning of his presentation. The question is not anymore on the what. We know the what. We know we want an inclusive society uh, empowering persons with a disability to live a life like everybody else. The how is a bit harder. And on that, we have to work together across borders, across cultures. Let's learn from each other, and let's try to make a difference together. Good afternoon to all. My name is Marie Lika. I'm a physical therapist. And together with the Friends Volunteers, we represent the therapeutic riding of uh, Ceres, which is uh, in northern Greece. I'd like to congratulate you for your presentations. I have two questions. One to Mrs. Ikonomo, whom I know many years. I would like to ask whether the research that was conducted so many years back, whether it could be repeated so that we can see certain differences. And uh, perhaps it could be repeated with more details. And we want to know whether it's possible for the last trends internationally with respect to general mainstream education and special ed education, or does this depend on the uh, s country itself? Sorry, do you, uh, can you summarize the, 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 about mainstream education? What was the second question? For mainstream and special education for children with uh, disabilities, what are the latest trends for them to be included in mainstream education immediately or like now in Greece we have special schools? What is happening generally? Um, tendency as far as uh, special education and general education is concerned. Um, is, is it all everybody going into mainstream education? Um, what is the tendency? Um, I can just answer the first question because it was to me. Um, also, yet uh, about the about the the survey that we made, of course, some time has passed, and there's no doubt that there are improvements. And I would say perhaps the main improvement is that the legislation has changed. It was absolutely necessary in Greece to have legislation concerning public buildings. 
and at least the new buildings are now accessible and people whose buildings are not accessible can get into quite a lot of trouble. So I would say that that is in a way what has changed and also of course attitudes have changed up to a point. Um, the other question, I would say in Greece it's mixed still between special education and mainstream education. Uh, what would you say about America? I don't know. I would say it's the same in America. Mm. You know, I think the Next. move is, is, you know, ideally towards inclusion and mainstreaming, but it's certainly, um, there are certainly benefits to specialized education for some students as well, so mm. it's a mix. Thanks. I think we, we only have a little bit more time, so maybe we can have one more question and, and give as many people as possible a chance to answer that. Hi, um, my question is quite simple. A number of people here have mentioned human rights uh, and uh, how important human rights are to disability. Uh, but none of the speakers have actually spoken about how they've actually strategically used the human rights framework to advance the rights of disabled people. And I wonder if Michael or Luke could talk about how that is done. Uh, we've just seen an example from Daphne where she talked about people carrying out a survey uh, which took a long time and then said that the thing that really changed uh, things in Athens was the passing of a new law. Uh, and I just wondered if you had a strategic approach uh, for those funders who work in this field. I, I can give you a um, very concrete example from Austria. Um, because I'm, of course, most familiar with the situation in, in Austria. In Austria, uh, the um, UN Convention for Persons with Disabilities is part of the Constitution. So the right is there. The, prob the question is, of course, right, how do we get that uh, on, on the ground? Uh, um, the, um, if we come to the built environment and accessibility of built environment, there's a, there's a, a legal obligation for everyone who for example, a shop owner who, who opens up a shop that this shop is accessible. Still, it's not done uh, because uh, the, the legal system in Austria is like this. Of course, it has to be accessible, but if it's not, uh, there's no uh, legal obligation to, uh, to make the shop accessible, but the, the person who runs the shop is fined. Um, he is just um, has, has to pay a duty for that. And the next one comes and does the same, he pays again this duty. No? So this is the, the, the legal Austrian system. So what's done now is uh, the Austrian community tries to, uh, to change that, that, that law and uh, to um, make, access, make access, accessibility according to the, to the UN Convention a right that, that also includes uh, that in accessibility has to be um, put on the ground. So uh, it's a constitutional issue. It's, and, and coming back to the issue, what the, a foundation can do, well, they can support uh, the legal costs of, uh, of this kind of, of strategic law cases. Hmm? Something wrong with this microphone, I think. With all microphones, I think. <laughs> Ah, yeah, we're back, we're back, okay. Uh, when it comes to, to human rights, um, my General Assembly uh, decided to take the uh, UN Convention as a framework for all actions and, and all strategies, plans, activities uh, we develop. And that is quite, quite important, I think, for a network uh, of service providers. Uh, and of course, we focus mainly on these articles that are relevant for, for, for service providers, specialized per so, uh, service providers. That means Article 19, independent living. Uh, we are very active in the field of um, uh, deinstitutionalization. And we know that that is not easy. And, and I even have members in my network that still provide a traditional type of services, but we sh you don't change the world by banging somebody with his head against the wall. Uh, you can change things by, by, by supporting people in their, in their willingness to change and to, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to adopt other, other approaches. So Article 19, Article 24, education, inclusive education is the way forward, I think. All research points in the same direction. The moment you put children on a segregating track, 
it is so difficult for them to get back on the mainstream track on, 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 uh, into society. And the third, the third domain is employment, of course, Article 26 and 27. These are very important for us. Crucial also is, um, for us in our work, uh, supported decision making, which is the Article 12 of the UN Convention. And it is about uh, legal capacity and, uh, and everything linked with, with having control over your own life. Uh, we, we as service providers think that we can uh, contribute to that uh, process as well. Uh, why do I talk about the support services first and then the rights? Uh, it is, it is uh, and that's a mistake, I think, and I uh, disagree with the European Commission on that. Uh, declaring rights is easy, but bringing people to the point that they can enjoy rights is a bit harder. Paper never refuses ink, but helping people to enjoy their rights is a bit harder. And that is quite often forget, forgotten. And also, it is very good, I think, that at the level of the European Commission, I don't know how that works in the States, but now disability, the disability unit moved from um, social affairs and employment to DG justice, which is good. That makes clear disability is something about human rights and enjoyment of human rights. But what we see in the, in the spin-off of that is more documents declaring the rights and clarifying for, clarifying the rights. But how you can support people so that they can enjoy these rights, that's a bit harder and that is quite often uh, forgotten. And again, that's uh, an area in which I think that uh, foundations could help us to make a difference because declaring rights is not enough. Thank you. Thanks. I think that's really a great, a great uh, way to end. Um, hopefully everyone enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. I, I think there is a lot that we can still continue to talk about. We'll have all, the rest of today and all day tomorrow during coffee breaks and lunch, and hopefully we can continue to work together and build some more networks. Thanks. <laughs>